young children at play. Look a little closer and you'll see young minds at work. Evidence is stacking up that the things children learn in their earliest years benefit them a lifetime. And this is a way that can truly change a child's life. Stimulation from high quality preschool and daycare experiences results in children better prepared to enter school, more likely to graduate, and more prepared to become productive workers. There's no period of growth in a human being that is more rapid than in the early childhood years. Indiana does not fully fund universal preschool, but has made some important steps. The state legislature voted to provide limited funding to a pilot program in 2014. Prior to this, Indiana had been one of 10 states without public funding for preschool. A lot of that research pointed to uh, the need for starting very early in life because the achievement gap has been identified as early as nine months of age. A growing chorus of people is saying that investment in early childhood education is one of the best investments a state can make. Absolutely, the most important product the American economy produces is ready for life 18 year olds. I'm Gary Dick. For the next half hour, we'll explore the business case for improving early childhood education, as well as the risk of inattention in little children, big returns. Support for this program is provided by a generous grant from the PNC Foundation. Recent studies have shown Indiana is number 44 in the United States when it comes to education. That failure starts early, due in part to a lack of state funding for early childhood education. Without a proper foundation, thousands of students start school behind, and they will likely never catch up. Open it. Statistically, seven out of 10 children need childcare because their parents are working. Um, so what we need to ensure, though, is that uh, there's enough supply of quality child care in order to meet that demand. Early childhood education, daycare, pre-K, preschool, no matter what you call it, it needs to be high quality. And what is stopping Indiana families from sending their young children to a high quality daycare? Cost. With no state funding for preschool education, the cost to parents is astronomical. Typically, um, child care is the largest monthly expense for families. Um, we, I looked at research last week that showed that um, a single mother who uh, needs infant care for their child, for her young child, is spending 41% of her income on child care. 41%. Um, and it's just not doable for, for many families. So they look for options that are easier to afford, easier to access, understandably, and, and the result is often that they don't get the, get the best. So I, I think it's our obligation as a community, as a state, um, and, uh, to ensure that every child birth through age five has, has access to high quality early childhood education if they need it. For more than a century, supporters have been working to create state-funded preschools. In fact, the drive for well-funded early childhood education was how Butler University's College of Education was founded. The roots of the College of Education actually at Butler University was founded by a woman named Eliza Blaker. And she moved here in the late 1800s and brought kindergarten to the state of Indiana and realized, oh, okay, they wanted to have kindergarten for children, but they didn't have teachers who were prepared. So her school began, and eventually that became the College of Education at, at Butler. Uh, we have the archives of all of her materials, and over 102 years ago, Eliza was writing to the state legislature saying, we need to fund preschool education and kindergarten education in the state because of the importance of the early years and in, in helping young children learn and supporting their families and helping parents learn how to be parents. The fight for state-funded preschool has been going on since the 1800s, but now, here in the 21st century, the tide may finally be turning. 
Indiana oftentimes takes a long time to study things, uh, but I'm thinking that right now, uh, with the movement I'm seeing in the legislature and with the interest from the uh, business community, that at long last we might be having a real breakthrough period of time where it's gotten more attention and more understanding and the possibility of funding is greater than it's ever been. The research says that the biggest return on our investment comes from implementing those high quality proven research-based programs for the poorest among us. That's where the biggest hit will come. It's, it, it's really a focus for us because we feel that it's a wise investment. Um, if you invest a dollar today, there have been numerous studies done that indicate that you'll get a return of up to $16 on that investment by helping children be prepared so that when they're, they enter school, they're ready to learn. Instead of entering school as much as a year and a half behind, never catching up, and ultimately ending up dropping out of school, um, the cost of remediation, sometimes sadly incarceration, are all costs to society that could be avoided if we were to give these children a healthy start with school. And there is a mind shift about how we view early child education. Uh, for the longest time, we as a society viewed daycare or childcare as something that was necessary in order for parents to work, and that's still very true. However, what we now know is that if um, children are spending their days in programs, and if we do the things necessary to make them high quality, to make sure they're safe, that they're healthy, that the children are stimulated by a caring adult that understands how to stimulate that child, how to help that child learn, then they're not just going to be cared for. It's not just babysitting, but it's school, it's education. And we know the difference between uh, quality uh, education and basically babysitting. Touch it, Lily. What does it feel like? Say soft? Yeah. Soft. I think the pieces are finally coming together for the greater community outside of just education, understanding that there's a, there's a huge cost of loss of human potential and uh, the economic uh, burden of this. Um, you know, Marion Wright Edelman, she's the uh, founder of the Children's Defense Fund. One of my favorite quotes uh, by Marion, she said, in America, we don't have uh, a money issue on this. We have a values and priority issue. And I agree with Marion on that. Uh, when we look at other countries who invest in their early childhood, we don't see the gaps in, in the, the children and we don't see the gaps that require more services, whether that's remediation, dropout, special education. We, we've known that, but those countries have made their children a priority. And some of these children don't even know their own name. You know, they, they don't know any of the letters of the alphabet. They don't know any numbers. And they're going into a classroom with kids who have been read to and who have been given the social, emotional um, development that they really need in order to be ready for life in school. What's the best way to get those ready for life 18-year-olds, the, the, those young people who can uh, work in teams, uh, think creatively, uh, persist at a project until they succeed. What are those sort of executive characteristics and when do they, are they formed in a person's uh, temperament? What the science shows is that it happens before age five. The 90 percent of the human brain uh, is formed. Now if you're ready cog behaviorally and uh, cognitively uh, to start school when, when it's time for you to, everything else downstream is going to be so much easier for them and they're, they're going to do so much better. And of course, there's widespread uh, recognition of the importance of, of or the high correlation uh, between uh, uh, education levels and personal income levels, and there's widespread recognition of the importance of, of having a well-prepared uh, workforce if you're going to have a thriving economy. And we see this as really foundational. In fact, that's not a bad way to look at it. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you ensure that the children are, are getting a, a, a solid foundation. The rest of us have a choice. You know, we can go in and we can say, all right, we're going to try to provide uh, some of the, uh, the supports that might be missing, uh, and, and we're going to invest up front 
in order to prevent problems and to help kids to develop, instead of doing as we've been doing and paying a whole lot more downstream for remedial education, public assistance, incarceration, and in all the insidious ways that all of us pay when we don't have a workforce with 21st century skills. With a move here and a move there. Education is the key that unlocks the door to a world of opportunity and simultaneously it cures a multitude of society's ills. So what better way to invest our money than starting early by investing in a child that can be productive in the future as opposed to living a life that will not be very rewarding and won't lead to much happiness for them. It's fascinating to me when you look at, at um, China, for example, they've been studying our early childhood programs for 15 years going, well, how do we do this? And they're investing in their early childhood. Well, okay, we're looking at economies. Well, uh, how are we comparing to China and the investments? So I, I think it's the number's going to grow and grow, but I think it's going to come from multiple sources of demand, from parental demand, business demand, education, competition demand will force this to grow. So I'm really trying to engage business in this conversation. I think it's been the missing piece of the conversation. There have been a lot of subject matter or experts and foundations that have known for a long time that this is where we need to be spending our money. But I don't think businesses quite get the connection. And I'm delighted to see that some of them like PNC and Lilly and Cummins are doing that. They know that it's more than just about education, but it has outcomes for lifelong health as well. And, and we are being crushed by the cost of incarceration, by tax money for people in poverty, and we need to find a way to, to change the game. And I believe, and I think the research uh, says very clearly, the place to start is early childhood. Very significant returns occur within a matter of 36 to 48 months after the pre-kindergarten. Here's why. Quality three-year-old, four-year-old pre-kindergarten for low-income kids reduces the probability that they'll be assigned to special education in public schooling. The drop in assignment rate in some areas is so high that the special education savings, in other words, the cost, public school cost of providing special education is reduced so much that that cost avoidance is enough to pay for the pre-kindergarten in the first place. One Indiana company stepping in and getting involved in early childhood education is the OSP Group on the near southeast side of Indianapolis. The company holds a carnival for area preschoolers every year, in addition to supporting the Early Readers Club and volunteering at area preschools. But OSP Group's involvement goes much further than simply entertaining children. First of all, it's an economic development issue. There's no question about that. Uh, we have an underskilled workforce today in Indiana, in central Indiana. Um, that's something that's uh, pretty common knowledge at this point. We have a lot of excellent programs going on um, currently uh, to try to um, remedy that issue. Um, but it's, it's, it's addressing the issue after it's happened. It's not addressing uh, the root issues. Um, you have an underskilled workforce. Um, you have an uh, um, unemployable segment of the population. Um, you have a situation there where if people aren't employable, obviously it's going to lend itself to escalated crime, drugs, um, certainly all of that undermining our neighborhoods. It's been a great recruiting tool for us, I guess in a sense. We don't do it to recruit, but we've been somewhat uh, pleasantly surprised that a lot of people have joined us and when they're going through interviews uh, after they've been with us for 60 to 90 days, a lot of them clarify that the reason they joined us is, yes, we're a good company, um, yes, we have a large presence in, in, in the uh, city, but uh, also because we're so aggressively engaged in um, early childhood development and so that, that makes us feel good as well. I think the biggest thing that we can do is to put early childhood education on the agenda of chambers of commerce in the state of Indiana. There are a few, like Indianapolis and Evansville, who are already doing that, but there are many who it's not even on the radar screen. 
And I think once they understand the connection, that that ought to be appearing there, and they ought to be making that part of their agenda. And I think it will take business leaders to make that happen. A couple of years ago, we um, initiated a business leader summit in Evansville, uh, where we brought together about 125 uh, business leaders from around our tri-state area. And we made the case for them as to the importance of early childhood education. And from that, uh, it led to the creation of a business leaders roundtable in Southwest Indiana that uh, is comprised of uh, the largest bank uh, in Evansville, uh, the largest public utility, both of the hospitals, the mayor's office, um, some private corporations, and they all come together every six to eight weeks and we talk about how we can advance the cause of early childhood through fundraising and advocacy at the legislative level. We provide professional development and grant maker education to our members so that they do their work effectively. Our role as the association um, of those members uh, is to, again to provide support to them um, with information uh, and connecting them to those that know what are the best ways that they can use their philanthropy to the, the greatest effect. Last year we did a, an early childhood funder summit, so we brought in a speaker with expertise in early brain development to talk about what, what that does, um, the role that that plays. Then we had a number of sessions the rest of that day that talked about different aspects of uh, what quality early learning experiences look like, um, examples of what some of our members across the state, the ways they have funded this area. So again, it's peers learning from each other. What are funders doing? Well, early childhood education has become a big priority at the United Way of Central Indiana. We attacked this in three different ways. The first was we wanted to make sure that parents understood that all daycares are not created equal and to drive them to ask hard questions that would lead them to be more likely to put their kids in quality care. The second was we went to the legislature and advocated for comprehensive child care legislation that would essentially protect these children and also ensure that public dollars were not used for daycare centers that were essentially unsafe or not providing any educational components for kids. Um, so we're not all the way there yet, but recently a law went into effect that basically requires daycare workers to be 18 or older and to pass criminal background checks. Yes, that was not required before. Um, so that is the result of our work and the great work of the legislature as well, and we will continue to push on this. The third is we're putting our money where our mouth is. So we have a 10-year, $12 million plan to invest in child care ministries and we have uh, touched 60 child care ministries and created over 4,000 spots for low-income children in our community, which were not there before. And our goal is to take those statistics I talked about before, the 17% of low-income children not having access to quality child care, to 80% in uh, 2021. And we've gone from 17 to 25% in just two years. There is plenty of research out there showing the huge return on investment that early childhood education can have, not only from a monetary standpoint, but from a community and workforce development standpoint. So what has made Indiana slow to follow the lead of other states? I think a lot of us are victims of a short-term outlook. Uh, we were used to instant gratification and we look for quick hitting, quick paybacks. And this is one of those cases where we have to have what I call a cathedral mentality and invest for the long term. Um, it's incredible that people in medieval ages would start to build a cathedral knowing that they would never see the end of it. And I think we need that kind of a long term perspective. I think it's in the best interest of our citizens. Well, I like to think about it like pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they do clinical trials before they ever put you know, a, a new drug out there. But even after a drug has been out there, it's five to seven years before they decide if the patent is going to be renewed and is it a drug that is actually producing the results or do we need to tweak it or do we need to change the formula? 
and we're patient about that because that's about wellness. Well, to me, investing in early childhood is about investing in wellness in children and wellness in the health of our education system and the health of our country. And so we have to be as patient with the data being collected uh, in early childhood as we are in other professions like the pharmacy profession. The Indiana General Assembly took an important first step. A pilot program was authorized to provide funding for early childhood education for up to 4,000 low-income children in five counties. Lawmakers also added some regulations to tighten standards for more than 1,000 unlicensed daycare centers. Advocates cheer the moves, but say more needs to be done. For the sake of the country, it's very important for Indiana not to be a laggard. It's very important for the Senate of, Indi of Indiana to look at this question and ask them, do they want to go another day and have other co companies and talented young people say, eh, I'm just not too sure about Indiana. But I think there's a growing awareness, there are a growing number of people who are really beginning to understand how important uh, high quality early childhood development is, especially for children in, in low income households. I think you know, these groups are going to have to continue to work together. You have the business community, the nonprofit community, and a lot of specific state legislators that are working very closely together now, more closely than ever over the past year, on trying to advance um, funding for these um, preschools um, in the state. That needs to continue to happen. That funding needs to happen. When the medical profession and the research, and what we know what you know, toxic stress in children, we, we know about brain development. Uh, you know, the medical field is saying, oh my goodness, the, the, the neurons that are firing, look at this, we're, we're missing out. And then you have the business community who says, whoa, this is a priority, people. We've got, we've got a problem here. We need to look at this. I think it's when other professions understand it and collaborate that it becomes a shared issue and a shared concern and a shared vision. And that hasn't happened. It's taken a while for those fields to come together. But I think one of the reasons I'm hopeful and optimistic now is at last those conversations are across discipline and across fields. And that's what it's gonna to take to move that forward. Making fundamental changes in the way we prepare our youngest citizens for school is tough but a business case is being made for bold action. It's kind of like, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you, you still have to eat it a bite at a time. But what is important is have a, have a cohesive framework within which we can make change as we go along and within which we can pick and choose the time to invest. You know, the money isn't maybe there right now to have the whole system, but we can begin to invest where we get the best early return on investments. And that's going to lead to, to lower costs as children go through school. Why not find a way to refunnel those savings back into growing the early childhood domain as we go? People in Indianapolis, look west. See what Salt Lake City is doing. Salt Lake City's business leaders have set up something called a Pay for Success Finance Early Learning Project. This is a project where Goldman Sachs, the investment banking company, has made a loan to pay for expanding pre-K in Salt Lake City using a special three-year, three four-year-old pre-kindergarten program that will reduce special education assignment rates by enough to pay for the pre-K, which enables to expansion of quality pre-kindergarten in Salt Lake City by 600 children, paid for entirely by the reduction in special education costs. And you know when you're going to get repaid because you're going to get repaid within 36 months. So for Indiana to understand what the competitive environment is like, that is state versus state, to attract business and talented young adults, look to the West, see what Utah is doing, and ask yourself, do you want to wait another day? Do you want to delay another week? Do you want to spend another year debating this? Take it up next year and get yourself on the path as recognized as a state that puts kids first 
puts their families first. Is that what you want to wait for? Or do you want to get on the path and start competing now? Every once in a while, I hear someone say, when we're talking about early childhood, the need for early childhood service, well, they'll say, it's the parent's responsibility. And you know what? I agree. It is. But if, for whatever reason, the parent is unable uh, to, to provide what's needed, doesn't know uh, what's needed, uh, or in some cases, unfortunately, refuses to provide what's needed, then the rest of us have a choice. Uh, we, can, we can try to provide some of those uh, supports and services that, uh, that will help get that child uh, moving in the right direction and, and, and uh, developing uh, properly, uh, mentally and, and, and socially, uh, or we can just sit back and do nothing and, and we pay an enormous price when that's the choice that we make downstream. But we can figure this out. We've got a lot of smart people and if we build on the strengths that we have, I think we can roll this out and, and we really have some just really marvelously intelligent people that know their stuff. I just hope they're not tired of saying it. I hope they will get re-energized, you know, to get their passion back to say, okay, I bang, I bang my head against the wall all these times, I'm gonna do it one more time. And I just hope they'll do that. And so there's an old uh, Stephen Covey began with the end in mind. If we want a different end in mind, then where do we begin? And we have to begin here. But we have a responsibility to our youngest children. And it's, it's, we've waited long enough, we've waited too long, and so now it's time. Let's not wait one more minute. I don't want to lose one more child to one more minute. Yes. Little Children, Big Returns. Support for this program is provided by a generous grant from the PNC Foundation.